All right. Uh, well, thanks for the introduction. Oh, I guess logistically, really quick, I'm I'm not going to be able to see you guys when I'm giving my talk, so just feel free to interrupt me. Um, I will also pause at certain points so that you can ask questions um, if you have any questions as they as they come along. I, unless you guys prefer that I just drill through the talk and then you have questions at the end, but I think it's more fun if it's interactive. Let's do what you think is more fun. All right, sounds good. Uh, so my name is Sarah. Uh, I was a PhD student at MIT, and I am just started as an assistant professor in Stanford. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about how to program a, a, a new class of analog computers to perform computation. Uh, and now these analog computers are um, not general purpose computers. They do not perform any sort of comp any like old computation. Uh, they are specifically designed to execute dynamical systems. Uh, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, uh, but dynamical systems are important, are important mathematical constructs. You can use them for a variety of different tasks. Uh, you can use them, for example, to study physical phenomena. Uh, you can use them in conjunction with sensors to analyze your surroundings. And of course, then you can extend that to include sensors and actuators, and, user dynam and you can use dynamical systems uh, to tune a, a physical device to, re to, to react to the environment. Control, control system is a classical example of this. And just to uh, kind of contextual, like frame the problem a little bit, uh, we'll be focusing on dynamical systems that you can represent with ordinary differential equations in this talk. Okay, so the way that these analog devices execute dynamical systems is a little bit non-standard. Uh, so within these analog devices, uh, there are collections of computational blocks. Uh, and these computational blocks, and as I mentioned, and, and basically these devices are programmable, right? So you can basically write bits to these devices um, to program them on the fly. And there's two ways you program them. Uh, first off, uh, you can enable interconnect in the device to form circuits, right? So you can use this programming technique to form a variety of different circuits, um, to form a variety of different circuits to implement your computation. The second way these devices are programmable are these, these blocks are actually um, themselves analog circuits, um, composed of transistors, capacitors, and whatnot. Uh, and they themselves have switches. Uh, so you can actually, and you can program those switches digitally uh, to basically change the functions implemented by the block. And so you can do this uh, to basically get the desired functions um, from the block on the device. And so basically you use these two programming techniques together uh, to uh, form a circuit composed of configured blocks where the physics of the circuit is analogous to the dynamics of the dynamical system you want to run. So for example, you could imagine forming the following circuit in the hardware, uh, where the physics of the circuit, the physics of your voltages and current, current uh, match the dynamics of like the dynamics of a, of a movement of a movement of a car, for example. And so the way you run your dynamical system, oh yes, uh, Sean. You might be muted. I can't hear you. Hello? Sean's issue appears to not be the muting, but something else like- Okay, I else. figured out. Um, can okay. you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Awesome, sorry about that. Um, so my only experience with something like this would be an FPGA, like a field programmable gate array. Is that a similar thing or is that a totally different technology that this is like way better than? Oh, it is a totally different technology, but some of the, that they share some common characteristics. Right, an FPGA is also a spatial computing device. So you're basically embedding a digital circuit uh, in an FPGA. Uh, whereas with this, you're, I mean, and in this you're embedding an analog circuit on this new configurable analog fabric. There are a lot of differences though. Uh, you don't really have a notion of memory in analog, so you can't buffer things. Uh, and this, this sort of circuits do not have things like clocks. Or, uh, you, so you, can, you don't really have this notion of like, the evolution, your notion of an evolution of state over time is basically uh, your derivative, your differential equation, or like the, the integration operation, right? So you don't, it's, it's not a digital computing fabric, but it is spatial in the same way as an FPGA. Uh, did that answer Ooh. your question? Yeah, that totally does. I just wanted to kind of like place it in my mind where, where this is. <laughs> yes, I mean, there are some commonalities. Like you'll see one part of compilation, like one of the parts of compilation uh, basically has an, an analog uh, in FPGA, so. Any other questions before I move on? Uh, yeah, sorry, I have a quick question. So if the dynamics of the circuit need to directly model the thing that you're trying to model, um, uh -huh. in an FPGA, uh, 
I would think it's like routing of the circuit in the device itself is almost a less constrained problem in an FPGA because so long as you satisfy the timing of the digital circuit that you're implementing on the chip, you can basically place it anywhere on the chip that you want. But mm -hmm. in, if I'm interpreting what you're describing, it sounds like the exact path length between these reconfigurable blocks are going to be extremely critical in order to get an accurate model. So may, maybe, maybe I'm jumping too far ahead, but it is a critical part of placing your model in this device, actually physically considering the connectivity of the device and considering the path lengths and crosstalk and, you know, this one line has a little more capacitance than the other and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, fortunately, uh, the hardware designer is designed to interconnect uh, so that we don't have to worry about things like crosstalk. Um, mm -hmm. As a result, there are very few interconnects available on the hardware. And I guess to jump ahead, uh, you do not need to worry about the path length because the time constants of the capacitors are so much, the, the capacitors integrated at a much slower speed than the, uh, than the delay mm -hmm. that the routing these signals to these interconnects would incur. Um, but uh, to, to answer your question about the, the crosstalk, I mean, the, the, the net result is that you don't have very many connections. So a, a big part of the placement operation, place and route operation, uh, or place and route path, is that you need to be very careful about how you lay out your blocks because sometimes there's only like four or five available uh, distinct paths mm. between certain parts, of your, certain parts of your chip. So it's actually a very impoverished routing environment compared to something like an FPGA. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anything else? All right, moving on. Uh, so basically, once you've built your circuit, once you've programmed the device uh, to implement the circuit um, that implements the dynamics of your dynamical system, the way you run your dynamical system is you power on the hardware. So you power on, you, you power on, like you, you basically unleash the capacitors, and uh, you observe the trajectory of the signals over time. Of, of, the, of the analog voltages and currents over time. Uh, and the reason why you're interested in the trajectories of these analog voltages and currents is because they correspond to quantities in your dynamical system. So you could imagine, for example, the signal moving through this wire could be analogous to, could correspond to the velocity of the car that we're modeling. And the current moving through this wire could correspond to the position of the car that we're modeling. So it maybe should not come as a surprise that these analog devices have some pretty interesting characteristics uh, that make them a little bit challenging to program using conventional programming methods. Uh, first off, uh, there is a wide variety of programmable analog blocks. So depending on the hardware you have at your disposal, you'll have a very different set of computational units at your disposal. Second off, uh, these analog blocks are designed for efficiency rather than uh, modulate, like, uh, rather than, so ra rather than implementing like a, a basic set of canonical functions, a lot of these blocks will implement uh, more exotic functions, right? So for example, you could imagine having a block, the orange block here, which implements two straight line functions, a differential equation, and has an initial condition. Conversely, you could imagine having the purple block here, which can be programmed in a variety of different ways to implement all sorts of variants of multiplication, uh, where none of these variants is actually classical multiplication. So you have to figure out how to compose together these blocks to form your circuit. Uh, second off, uh, these analog blocks are analog, they're, they're analog blocks, and so they have analog behavior. Right? So it's not enough for you to consider uh, the function implemented by the block. You have to consider the operating range and frequency limitations imposed by the block. You have to consider the effect of analog noise on the, on the signals and the effect of quantization error on the digitally settable data fields in the block. And because these, are, these blocks are leveraging the, the, the actual physics of transistors, and because transistors are subject to process variation post-fabrication, uh, you also have to consider the effect of process variation uh, for the specific device you have on hand. Uh, so all of these characters together uh, make these challenging targets for compilation and programming. Uh, for uh, my uh, thesis, yes? Uh, just a question about your previous slide, just before it gets mm -hmm. to ahead. Hey, go for it. Why, oh would my God. why would quantization error be a concern in this device if they're purely analog? Because uh, a lot of these blocks will have a digitally settable data field, which correspond, mm -hmm. they basically, you can think of them as a voltage and current sources, right? So for example, um, you could have a block with a programmable gain term, uh, mm -hmm. where if you set of if you set your data field to to like a, you set your data field to a decimal value, and it internally mm -hmm. generates an analog current. I see. And uh, then to that end, I guess would you also have to consider the dynamic range of the devices before they become nonlinear? So if I'm imagining that some of these multiplication blocks might be like an op amp in a block or something like that, you're going to yep. only have so much range before you saturate the input to the amplifier. So is that a concern as well? 
Yeah, so the operating range limitations basically describe the regime of uh, the, the, the range of the currents and voltages for your input for, for the signals that your input port. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things, and these are usually specified by the hardware designer. And one of the, one of the things that they consider when they specify these, these ranges is uh, how much of the range can we actually accurately uh, multiply without introducing things like uh, nonlinearities or distortion. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else before I move on? All right. Moving on. So uh, for my thesis, I developed compilation techniques for this class of devices. Uh, and I built the first ever compilation tool chain uh, that targets a real world analog device of this class. And so you can see that's my experimental setup and this was joint work with Columbia University. So they actually furnished me with an analog computing prototype, analog computer prototype. Okay, so how does this compilation process work? Uh, well, to, before I describe the compiler, I think it would be very instructive to describe the inputs and outputs, right? So uh, one input into the compiler uh, is the dynamical system, right? And the way you specify the dynamical system to the compiler is you encode your dynamical system using the dynamical system specification language. You can basically think of this as a specification language, which allows for you to, to describe a first order ordinary differential equation, uh, as well as um, indicate which variables you're interested in observing. So this specific dynamical system here is a harmonic oscillator. And uh, it basically models uh, three, two variables and observes one. It models the velocity and position of your harmonic oscillator uh, where we're observing the position over time. I'll be using this, uh, this uh, specification uh, as, as an example um, for other parts of this talk. And so basically, if you were to run this uh, dynamical system uh, for a prescribed set of time for 20 simulation time units, for example, you'll see that it oscillates. Uh, where the position implements uh, the cosine function and the, and then, yeah. So ba basically, this is the runtime behavior of the dynamical system. And this is the specification. Uh, the compiler also takes uh, the uh, as, as input as specification of the analog hardware. Uh, this hardware specification basically uh, tells, indicates what kinds of blocks you have at your disposal and how they can be programmed, right? So uh, for example, uh, you could specify an integrator block uh, where the input output, where you can specify an arbitrary input output relation for the integrator block. And of course you also specify the programming interface. Uh, and the language that I offer allows for a couple different programming methods. Uh, the first off you can specify a decimal, a digitally settable data field, uh, which maps to a decimal value. Uh, for example, the integrator block has a digitally settable initial condition V0, which you can see uh, appearing in the relation here. And then the other programming method I support is um, basically uh, digitally settable modes. And so basically you can think of each block as implementing a parametric function, where by setting the mode, you can change the function uh, implemented by the block. The hardware specification language also supports the specification of operating range and frequency limitations, quantization error, analog noise. And it allows for the hardware designer to specify the general structure of the process, process variation induced behavioral deviation. So in short, in addition to specifying the input output relation of your blocks, you also specify all the physical effects that govern your block behavior. And the other part of the hardware specification language basically describes how you can connect these blocks together. So you will you can encode all the digitally settable connections between blocks in this language. So Sarah, yeah. that yeah. reminds me um, of like hybrid input output automata in formal methods, except those are like awful to work with and this seems good. Um, it, is there, I mean, it seems like there's maybe a connection, right? You have modes, which are, this the same and mode switching and then you have I guess the, the thing that's different is you don't have like a controller and a plant that are somehow uh separately modeled do you know do you know what the formal difference would be or is is this not something you're familiar with I do not yeah I'm not super familiar with this um maybe we, you can describe it to me in a little more detail afterwards and yes, uh, we can try to explore uh, what the what the key differences are here okay thanks yeah, I mean, this is very much a domain specific sort of thing too, right? Like I'm, I'm seeking to mo model the hardware behavior. So sure. maybe it's not as general, we'll see. Okay, so the output of the compiler is the configuration for the analog device. And you can basically think of it as a, uh, as a textual representation of an analog circuit composed of configured analog blocks, right? Um, where basically uh, the analog device configuration uh, tells the runtime how to configure, how to program each block, so you'll see they'll specify which mode each of the blocks should be in and how each of the data fields should be set, right? So for example, this configuration here uh, says the integrator two should be set in MM mode and the initial condition D0 should be set to 10. Uh, and then of course, the other part of the analog device configuration indicates which subset of digitally settable connections to enable, 
So these two pro these two specific these two configuration commands together it just fully describes the, the circuit. And then of course there's one other part of the analog device configuration, and that is um, the wire labels. And so basically the configuration will indicate uh, which signals implement which dynamical system variables, right? So for example, this configuration has these two wires labeled P and V. And what this indicates, uh, what this tells the uh, runtime and the end user is that if you observe the signal moving through um, this wire, um, it'll evolve in accordance with the position of our harmonic oscillator. And if you will observe the uh, signal moving through this wire, this will absorb, this will evolve with accord in accordance with the velocity of our harmonic oscillator. And so I should mention this is configuration, this example configuration models the harmonic oscillator I introduced earlier. Uh, so there's all the components of the analog device configuration. Uh, now we can move on to the compiler. So the first step of compilation involves synthesizing a circuit composed of configured blocks. Uh, it produces an output, an analog device configuration, where the circuit physics matches the dynamical system dynamic. Uh, this configuration completely ignores the analog behaviors of the block and does not consider any, anything such as, does not consider the noise, operating range, operating range restrictions, process variation, or anything. Basically, all analog behaviors ignored at this point. The second part of compilation uh, is automated scaling. And, this prop, and what this procedure does is it scales all of your circuit parameters to account for all of your unwanted physical behaviors. So this part of compilation reasons about the noise quantization error, process variation, and the operating range and frequency restrictions imposed by the hardware. The end result is a scaled analog device configuration, which actually runs a different dynamical system in hardware. However, this dynamical system is structured in such a way where you can recover your original dynamics at runtime. The other characteristic of the configuration is that it abides by all of the physical restrictions in the hardware. And so this is actually what you execute on the analog device. All right, so this is the choose your own adventure part. Uh, I don't have time to talk about both circuit gener generation and automated scaling. I can talk about one. Uh, is there any, are there any preferences on which one I discuss? I vote for circuit generation, but I'm interested in what the rest of the democracy believes. <laughs> I vote for, for circuit generation too. All right, two for circuit generation. I guess uh, we yeah. So let's go with circuit generation then. Okay, I call it, let's call it circuit. I mean, I guess uh, yeah, circuit generation, circuit synthesis, uh, same idea. All right, so to to recap what circuit what the circuit synthesis procedure does, um, it takes an input, a specification of the dynamical system to implement into hardware, and a specification of the analog device which basically describes all of the programmable blocks that you have. And it produces a configuration for that analog device uh, where the dynamics of the analog device configuration match the dynamics of our dynamical system. Uh, and before I talk about the circuit synthesis procedure, I'll talk a little bit what I mean by the dynamics matching. So basically the idea is um, if you take any of these labeled wires and prop symbolically propagate the, the variable implemented by that wire through the circuit, um, we'll, you'll be able to validate that the dynamics match for all other labeled wires. And I'm just going to walk through an example here. If we take this wire labeled V, which implements the velocity of our harmonic oscillator, and we propagate it through the, through the dynamics of the CMOL2 block, uh, we will find that the output of the CMOL2 block equals 2 times V. Now, if we take this signal uh, coming out of the CMOL2 block and we propagate it through the integrator 2 block, uh, we'll find that this watt, the current, the analog current, coming out of uh, output port Z of integrator two has the following dynamic. And since this wire is labeled P, uh, we should be able to validate that the dynamics of the current moving through this wire match the dynamics of the position of the harmonic oscillator. So here are the dynamics of the current at the wire labeled P, and here's the dynamics of the position of our harmonic oscillator. So you'll see that they don't actually syntactically match up. Um, however, uh, if you, there, you, you'll be, you, you, can, you can see that they're algebraically the same, right? You can rewrite the top uh, dynamical system uh, to match the bottom dynamical system by applying algebraic rewrites. And so uh, what if the dynamics of a circuit match the dynamics of the dynamical system, you can verify this property uh, for, every, uh, for every labeled wire in the circuit. So you could repeat this process for the wire labeled V and you will find uh, that again, the analog current, the symbolic expression describing the evolution of the analog current uh, on the wire labeled V does not syntactically match our velocity, how, the, dynamic, the dynamical system relation describing the velocity. However, again, you can rewrite one to equal the other by applying algebraic rewrite. So they're to some effect semantically equivalent. Okay, 
So now that we understand uh, what it means to produce a circuit with matching dynamics, we can talk a little bit about how synthesis produces the circuit that has matching dynamics. So it's broken up into three steps. Um, for the first step is sub-circuit synthesis. And what this step does is it synthesizes a circuit fragment uh, that implements each relation in the dynamical system. Uh, then the second step of, of the circuit synthesis procedure takes all of these fragments and assembles them together, routes them together to form the completed circuit. Uh, and then the last stage of compilation is the place and route procedure, which basically maps each of the blocks to locations in the analog hardware. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, maps connections in the circuit to digitally settable interconnects in the analog hardware. Okay, so how does sub-circuit synthesis work? So the first step of sub-circuit synthesis involves picking a relation to synthesize. Uh, and so we're gonna pick the relation governing the position of our harmonic oscillator here. Next up, we pick a block, uh, non-deterministically from the hardware specification. So we're going to pick this integrator block here. And now the goal becomes, can we configure the integrator block uh, to implement, to, so that the output current at port Z is algebraically equivalent to the position of our harmonic oscillator. So in simple terms, we want the, the current coming out of Z to equal P. And we have two degrees of freedom here. We can set uh, the analog current coming into X to a symbolic expression, and we can set Z zero to a constant value. So you can see that if you set X to two times V and Z zero to 10, uh, then you can get these two relations to almost be algebraically equivalent. And the reason why I say they're almost algebraically equivalent is because integration in the hardware is done with respect to hardware time. And integration in the dynamical system is done with respect to dynamical system time. So to mitigate this, all you do is you state to the world that one unit of dynamical system time equals one unit of hardware time. But if you just state this uh, and keep this in mind, uh, then at this point, you can, you, you, you can say that these two relations are equal. Uh, and that you successfully implemented uh, the position of the harmonic oscillator at output port C. But we're not done yet. Um, and the reason why we're not done is now we have to provide two times V into port X. And so we repeat the process. We're going to pick another block. Uh, in this case, we're gonna pick the CMO block. Um, and then we, you, we, repeat, we basically unify the uh, two times V, the X equals two times V relation uh, with the W equals C times Q relation. Um, and we find that uh, if you set the digitally settable data field C to two, uh, and if you provide an analog current implementing V to port Q, then port W will compute to two times V. So at this point, we're done just synthesizing the fragment. Uh, you simply remind the compiler, hey, um, make sure you provide a signal implementing V into port Q, an analog current implementing P, V into port Q. And if you do this, then I will produce a signal which implements the position P at port Z of the disintegrator. So to recap, uh, we, generated, we generated a fragment where the physics of the uh, output of the fragment is analogous to the dynamics of our dynamical, of the, of the position of our harmonic oscillator. So we repeat the process. Um, we produce another fragment which implements the velocity of our harmonic oscillator. Uh, so again, uh, the output, the, the, the symbolic expression governing the current output port Z is going to be, again, algebraically equivalent to the velocity of our harmonic oscillator. We just one more time to get this observed P statement, uh, which basically uh, creates a fragment that routes the position P uh, to an observation block. So at this point, we can assemble them together. Uh, this process is largely straightforward uh, with a couple caveats. Uh, basically, the idea here is that you route signals from where they're produced to where they're needed. However, uh, because we're working with analog currents, you cannot actually use an analog current more than once without compromising its fidelity. So what you, what we, what you have to do is you have to insert current copiers um, to produce multiple copies of a current that you want to use in multiple places. And it turns out these current copiers can do some limited form of computation. Uh, so you can also um, implement some, some simple functions for these copiers. So for example, this copier block um, produces two copies of, of uh, the signal implementing P. One of these copies is positive and one of these copies is negative. And that's because it's in any it's in neg mode, um, which basically produces a positive and a negative copy instead of a positive and a positive copy. And then at this point, we have a completed circuit, uh, which basically implements our dynamical system, and all that's left is the place and route procedure. Um, I don't I don't have to, I usually uh, don't go over the place and route procedure because it's uh, complicated and uh, not n like related like rel it is also like, a, like maybe one of the less interesting parts of the problem. But the general idea is uh, you take each of these blocks. 
uh, and you map them to locations on the hardware, and then the connections get mapped to digitally settable interconnects. And sometimes you need to map these connections, you need to introduce additional blocks to make these connections uh, feasible. Uh, and that is the synthesis procedure. We will skip the scaling procedure, um, even though I also think it's pretty interesting. Uh, and I can just talk about the results uh, briefly. So I've, as I said, I evaluated this on an actual piece of analog hardware. Uh, and I evaluated on a collection of 12 benchmarks. Uh, five of these benchmarks are um, basically from our, my collaborators. They're physics benchmarks. Um, some of them are linear, some of them are nonlinear. Uh, the remainder of the benchmarks are from my own work. Um, some of these are biological systems. So for example, the botulism neurotoxin model, biological system. Uh, and then some of these are also controls applications, like such as the common filter in the PI controller. Um, and yeah, so I kind of widened the set of domains that I, I would have considered for this, uh, for this work, for, to target this chip, when we're targeting this chip. So here are the reference uh, trajectories for each of these computations. Um, as, I, I got all these reference trajectories by running a high precision digital solver. All of these systems were closed systems. Uh, and so if you try to synthesize these uh, circuits without doing scaling, uh, you actually can't run any of these on the hardware. Um, you can produce circuits, um, but these circuits uh, cannot be dispatched either because they contain data field values that are outside of the operating range of the data fields or because they violate operating ranges, operating range or frequency restrictions internally. Uh, and then if you use scaling, uh, you'll see that you can get signals that much more close. You can, we were able to run all the benchmarks and you can see that the, uh, so I guess I should mention, uh, the green lines are what, what I collected from the oscilloscope. Uh, and then the red lines are the reference signals. So you can see that um, each of the, the, that the, the electrical signals uh, very closely matched up uh, with the trajectories that I was expecting. And so you might ask how these, how these, this hardware performs. Um, so for each of these benchmarks, uh, the hardware consumed between uh, 0.395 and 8.64 milliwatts of power. And depending on how many simulation time units I wanted to run each of the uh, benchmarks for, uh, the computations took between 0.5 to 6.58 milliseconds. Uh, the net energy of this uh, is between 0.28 microjoules and 5.67 microjoules. Uh, so this is a very low energy, low power platform. Here are my contributions. I'm happy to take questions or to discuss other parts of the compiler uh, if you guys are curious. Sarah, this is super cool and we are very much wowed. So thank you very much. Oh, good. Much. I'm glad you found it interesting. Yeah, I've never seen any work like this and it's awesome. So thank you very much. Yeah, it was uh, interesting, like, definitely interesting problem to work on, uh, a lot of risk. Are you familiar with um, like cyber physical systems literature? You know yeah, that? vaguely. I talked to Andreas Platzer a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, definitely some, they're not unrelated. Yeah, uh, I'll let Billy ask his question, but my question is, is maybe something to look into the, in the future, which is to what extent your work relates to that stuff, because there's like a lot of really serious math that hasn't really been backed up with any actual building of anything in the CPS and hybrid automata space. And I'd be really curious uh, how the formalisms actually compare. Uh, but anyway, Billy, why don't you take it away? Thank you. And, and thank you, sir. This is really interesting. Um, so I have a few questions, but I think I'll stick to one for right now. Um, you mentioned a point that um, in order to implement some of these applications on the hardware itself, you have to know the frequency response of the system in order mm -hmm. to actually uh, ensure that it will work on the hardware. Uh, and for certain types of nonlinear processes, you won't necessarily know how the frequency of the system will behave until you actually solve it. And if my understanding was correct, you sort of mitigated this problem by solving, solving it numerically first and then confirming that it'll work on the hardware that you're gonna implement it on. But if you have to solve the differential equation before implementing it on the hardware, then that seems like that would defeat the purpose of the hardware itself. Um, so can you comment on how this might scale for solving nonlinear problems in general? Uh, sure. Uh, so, I mean, I would say that for the kinds of applications I think this hardware would be good for, uh, running the computation does not actually um, defeat the purpose of using the analog hardware. Like for example, if you're doing a sensor processing application, uh, you might want to run the computation and simulation on a variety of the external signals first, uh, and then you can use the, the, the data you collected from that to do the compilation. Because the, the point is, like, I'll give you an example. You want to write like a, something that does a smart, generates a smart interrupt. 
and does anomaly detection on external on a sensor input at low power, right? So you can design this dynamical system, uh, you know, on the on the with your host computer and like do all of the and run a bunch of on a bunch of test inputs and determine where your frequency limits are, and then you can uh, you just you compile many dispatch. The, compiled, the, the the configuration to the hardware, and then you run that you run that on your production system. Mm -hmm. So it involves. Get, sorry, go uh, ahead. Go, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I guess the other thing is I do not reason about um, I do not actually propagate the frequent the, the the frequency like the the maximum frequency through nonlinear blocks. I actually work with the frequency limit only applies to the time constant mapping in the capacitor. So you might actually have higher frequency signals um, somewhere else in the circuit. I mean, it's it's something that could also be. That, that would need to be like investigated in, next, in future work. Right, yeah, I think that was sort of more the crux of my question is like, how do you know that this, the, uh, the voltages involved in solving some nonlinear differential equation aren't required to oscillate at very high frequency in order to implement the solution? And I think to the best of my knowledge, you don't necessarily know that until you solve it. Um, but it yeah. sounds like what you're saying is if you can study the system that you want to model sufficiently beforehand, you can make a reasonable claim that it's not going to have this behavior and that it will therefore map well to the hardware. Is that a yeah. correct interpretation? Yeah. So, I mean, currently, like, you would need to run this, you need to run this system dynamically. Hmm. Not making yes. a claim you can't do it statically, right? Um, yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sean, what's your, what's your question? So, um, sort of relating to that, um, is the main focus of devices like these going to be the fact that they're low power and they're able to do fairly complicated uh, differential equation solving quickly and with like little energy use? So, like you were saying, it, it could be used to to catch anomalous uh, like conditions in some physical system and like like make an alert or something like that. Um, is that the main focus, or is it also useful for solving? problems that we're having difficulty solving uh, with traditional computational techniques? I think that the sweet spot is um, the sort of low power um, responsive computation uh, on external signals, right? I mean, these the sorts of, one of the cool characteristics of this computational model is that I can tell you at compile time, the mapping between hardware time and dynamical system time. So if you know how many simula, if you know how much, how much, how long you want to run your system in simulation time, you actually get a, close to a guarantee on like how long your system will take to evolve in hard, on, like in real time, right? So this could be great. This is great for, uh, you know, applications that need to be operated at low power and they need something responsive. Uh, now, if you're running like a linear system, there are ways you can, uh, you, you know, keep solve linear systems with like a microcontroller relatively efficient, efficiently. Uh, but when, when your system starts having nonlinear dynamics then I think it becomes harder. Um, so I guess like the very, uh, the very specific like area where I think this hardware will, will win out is a low power responsive computation where you have to use a nonlinear system uh, to process your signal. That's kind of where I think this hard. No, I mean that's kind of where I think this hardware will, would win. Now, when people have looked at, like, I mean, I know that my collaborators were really interested in the numerical computation side of it, um, but just because this hardware is not very miniaturizable, um, you're just not going to have. Like, I mean, I only have 64 integrators on the chip that I have, right? So it's, you're not you're not going to be running huge systems. And while there are arguments that you can scale this up, um, I'm more interested in figuring out what we can do with this hardware now, right, with what we have. So did that answer your question? Ooh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Sarah, Speaking of hardware now. Oh, go ahead, Max. Can your systems do discrete mode switches in between, like, in essence, if you had two computers and you switch in between them, depending on some variable or something like that? Discrete mode switches. Are you talking about you would have a variable that has like a discontinuity? Okay. Um, I'm almost two want... different circuits, and you basically decide which one you want to use depending on uh, the state of a variable, and and you can you can switch back and forth between them. Um, so something like yeah. an else statement. I, the problem is I don't know any of the hardware stuff, so my my language is limited here. But yeah, you could do that. I mean, one way to do it that would I guess be a little bit less resource efficient is you write both cir both circuits to the hardware. Right. Uh, and then you uh, you have your ADC look at one wire when you're running one of the computations and look at the other wire when you're running the other one. Right, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, like a, a problem that's still, uh, like, I guess, open for this hardware is uh, if you want to re if you want to change some aspects of the system you're running on the fly, you will need to find what you would need to, you would, there would need, you need to have a way of, of like quickly reprogramming, reprogramming sure. it. Um, 
And I think that is something I, that I'm interested in that I also haven't explored. Hey, quick, quick question. First of all, thanks for your talk. Um, mm -hmm. Building on some of the themes here, um, you said you were interested really in seeing how these systems can be used now. Um, I, I just finished reading um, actually Richard Hemming's like art of doing science and engineering. And he talks about in that book, how like way back analog computers were all the rage. You were, they were used for like controlling gun positions, but then really like digital computers have dominated. Um, like, do, do you see that really changing? Because in some ways, like, isn't one of the nice things that computers you can abstract out a lot of the real world and insofar as Moore's law to a certain extent continues, um, like you've talked about a couple of areas where low power and time, are there any other areas on the Wikipedia page for uh, analog computers? It's, there's a little section at the bottom about the resurgence and it's kind of cool that your, your collaborator uh, Listed there, yes, yeah. it is listed there. It's pretty cool. But like, and, and there it actually mentions like potentially like fuzzy logic as one area. So just curious to like get, like, yeah, like again, why? I'm coming at it from like, yeah, why? No, I, no, I understand. I understand. Uh, so I actually, had to, I actually had to read a lot of those old school analog computation papers uh, and uh, manuals and all of that stuff uh, for my thesis. Um, but so, uh, I mean, analog compu computation has actually never really gone away. Um, you have analog circuits in almost any production system to interact with the environment. Like for example, your uh, sensor, like a lot of sensors have analog circuits in them. Receivers have analog circuits in them. And that is because uh, they cannot do the computation digitally because they have to, they have to, they have to uh, process a fast evolving signal at low power and sampling it would be prohibitively, prohibitively expensive. So I, the, the, the benefit of using a reconfigurable analog device is that you can, get reprogrammability so you don't have to hire an analog design team to implement your computation. Um, but then you get the, the characteristics of using an analog circuit. So I think that there actually, there are, there are use cases today for analog circuits because we, they, they exist in you know, the systems and this just adds a configurability dimension to it. Very cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Billy? Yeah, sorry, I might ask you to clarify that last point about analog devices in things now. I mean, for the examples you gave, like the analog circuitry for RF communications and phones and things like that are inherently using a digital protocol. They're just sending it over an analog carrier. Um, and ultimately in, in that case, those protocols tend to be quite immune to noise because they decode analog signals into code words. Whereas your system is more so relying on the analog voltages themselves and things like that. So. I guess this was going to be very, I think uh, Wes captured what my question was going to be originally very well, which was sort of like, there used to be a lot of research in analog computation. And from my understanding, it was sort of largely discounted for a while because it was so prone to noise and prone to errors and things like that. Um, I think the crux of my question is more so like, what do you think made it possible for people to say, hey, we should look into this more now? Like, do you think it's that technology is just good that we can make low noise electron, like electronics that are low enough noise that it's not a problem? Do you think it's that um, now we can integrate them to be small enough to be useful? Uh, I think what, what, in your opinion, makes it practical to reconsider analog electronics as a primary computational module rather than just sort of these ancillary systems in the electronics that we mostly use? Well, I mean, first of all, it would be used as a co like I mean, I'm not advocating running like the your kernel on it, right? Like it, it would be a coprocessor or something that you would you would use uh, for kind of a domain specific application. Um, and as for why why is the question kind of why now? Like why? Yeah, like well, I, I guess why now? I mean, kind of like you, I think it's it's rare to see analog co and correct me if I'm wrong. I, I imagine you've looked into this a lot more than I have. I think it's my impression is that analog coprocessors in modern electronics you know, electronics are fairly uncommon if it's something that can be done digitally. So like something like a sensor, you can't really do that digitally because you have to interact with the world. Something like an RF receiver, you can't do digitally because you have to send an electromagnetic wave to something else. But what, you're, what my interpretation of what you're proposing is that you're saying you can replace complicated digital computations with something analog. So in, indeed it would be something like a coprocessor but it's still performing a critical element of the computation that you're trying to do. So yeah, why, why now? Yeah, the first one make a case for working on hardware. So, okay, I mean, this hardware is research hardware. This is a 
this is hardware research, right? Uh, and the thing is, hardware designers uh, can't fully explore a particular computational method or a particular hardware substrate without software support, right? I mean, the people I worked with, um, they were, they're not compiler, they're analog designers. They are not compiler writers. They are not anywhere near the software stack. And so the way they would explore whether their hardware was capable of running computations, they'd manually configure it. And it was years of someone's PhD thesis, figuring out how to manually construct a circuit, which I did automatically, right? So in some sense, you need software to push hardware forward. And it is entirely possible that we push this hardware as far as it can go, and it doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But hey, it's also possible uh, that, you know, with, so with this uh, with continued software research and hardware research, that it does go somewhere. And in that case, the software enabled that direction in hardware. Uh, so that, that's the case for why it's worthwhile doing this research, even if the hardware doesn't seem like immediately applicable. Like we're not gonna put it in a phone today, right? Like it still has issues, right? Um, and I guess like another thing I wanna say is that um, software's come a long way too. Like the analog, the, the analog hardware I work with is actually much higher error than the analog hardware from the 60s. So like we're talking about 5% error on blocks, one to 5% error on blocks, right? But the thing is, we've gotten so much more sophisticated with the kinds of things you can do in the co in compilers uh, that I can make a lot of this error go away. Um, which I mean, you saw like at least in like experimentally, right? That uh, you, you could get agreement between, between signals um, purely by using software techniques to transform your computation. Um, as for like, why would you want to use this now? I would actually not advocate that this hardware you put in anything like commercial now, right? It's uh, pretty big. Uh, like, it, I mean, and there are, there are parts of it that are unexplored. Well, so I think, uh, I was just gonna say, I think what you, I think you answered my question well, because I think my interpretation is that why now? It's like, well, now there's good software support because of your effort. And that seems to be the critical thing that was missing. So this is very cool. Thank you. And I think the other thing to mention is that, uh, I don't want to beat the Moore's Law dead horse, uh, but uh, I think nowadays we're thinking, like we, we think of a lot of different, uh, we, we consider a lot of different things when we think of a computational medium, right? Before it was just like, let's make it go faster, like faster, 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 right? But now we think about energy efficiency. We might think about like, oh, how open source is the hardware, right? Um, like, a lot of open, like a lot of open source hardware designs require that you use larger transistor nodes, I mean, process nodes for transistors. And uh, those larger process nodes don't support fitting as many transistors on your computational, on your, like in, in your design. And uh, it's just what happens with analog, uh, you can use very large transistors and still do meaningful computation, right? Um, so cost and, uh, and accessibility could be, could be a, a factor here. I mean, there's a lot of things that you, you, that, you know, that go into, that, that now people consider when they think of design. Very cool, thank really, you. Really brief question. You mentioned, did I hear you right that but like back I'm in sorry, the 60s you, you, and the five. Cut out a bit. Can you repeat that? Okay. I'm, I'm yeah, maybe a mode switch. Um, hmm. You mentioned that, like, did I hear you correctly that it was a 5% like improvement in the hardware back in the 60s, but the software was terrible? No, so, so now... the, the, the blocks that you had in the back in the 60s uh, could, be could be produced with very, very high precision because uh, they weren't like a piece, it's not a piece of silicon, right? You, with the old school analog computers, you literally had like no modules that you would stick into your analog computer. And those could be manufactured with very little variance across blocks. And the block, then the, because they were using voltages, like large voltages, um, they also had a lot more stability with their signals. Uh, with this hardware, I'm using tiny currents and everything is embedded in a piece of silicon. So I have tons of variation across blocks. Uh, the currents are subject to more noise uh, and I'm still able to do the computation reasonably in this, in this medium. Uh, so the trade-off is like size, like you have a much smaller device? Size and fabrication mess, and like just like you get, I mean, it's a CMOS chip. They aren't using some sort of weirdo, like, you know, fabrication process. It's just like 45 nanometer, I think six, either 45 or 65 nanometer process node uh, for a CMOS, you know, CMOS fabrication process, not anything exotic. Kind of interesting that, like, in, in this world of software obsession, the software is getting better, but like the hardware actually interesting that there are trade-offs there that aren't, aren't always just better. So kind of, kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, for this, cool. like, I think that they kind of opted for, I mean, one of the, the, the it consumes very little power. Right. And I mean, I think that some of the decisions that they made that occurred to higher error uh, were because they wanted to hit this power energy figure. 
Um, can I go? <laughs> yeah, sure. Sweet. Um, so my next question is, how long until we can get like a Raspberry Pi-esque thing where we can play with this software you've made and like try it <laughs> and make little toy circuits? <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, one of the things that's on my docket, I mean, because I, I helped them, since I did this work, uh, they fabricated 10 more chips, and so I tested that, because I, I mean, I think I didn't talk about, oh, this is kind of a cool thing, though, with this work. One of the things I do is I actually do a form of, like, bespoke compilation, where I build, like, models for the chip I have on hand, and then I target that particular model, and this allows for me to account for process variation statically. Um, and so, like, uh, because I had to characterize these chips, come up with these models to target in compilation, um, I could test these chips. And so I tested all the chips for them. We sent them out to a couple people and I'm working on setting up one that you can access remotely in my lab for researchers that want to play with this hardware. That's so fun. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know very much about hardware. I've sort of gone down That's to the fine. level and nothing below that. But one thing is that it feels like every, almost everything in computer science seems like a nail to the hammer of digitalness, unless you have something really specific and then you can have some people design and fab some cool analog thing for you. But it seems like a lot of your work is sort of, how can we make these analog parts more modular and usable in a broader range of contexts? Do you have any like insights about what things we see as digital nails, but really should be solved in an analog way? Is it really just like, I guess this is going back to the sort of, you discussed it as low power and um, quick turnaround. Like, are there any other types of ideas you think now or speculations about what type of things it would be in the future that you could solve with these analog components? Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one thing that I've been very interested in is uh, the idea of doing uh, optimization on the fly. Uh, this comes up a lot in like robotics and it apparently also comes up in power electronics. Uh, I was talking with somebody who built an ASIC that does, uh, is basically it's computing, it's, it's dynamically computing a set of parameters using an analog circuit. And the reason why they have to do it in analog is because if they, all, any additional power they consume directly take, consumes power from their battery, right? So the lower power you can make your, cir your circuit that's doing all of this uh, power conversion, uh, this doing the power conversion operation, the less uh, power you're shaving off of your, uh, the, the, the less, uh, the, 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 less uh, the more utilization you get out of your battery. Anyway, but I guess like a nonlinear constraint optimization, I think could be a really cool, cool use case. And that's a pretty, I think that comes up in a lot of, a lot of uh, situations. Well, and, and you were saying there, I, I think you, one of the example curves you showed was a PI controller yep. thing. Yep. So you can do PI and like, presumably you could make one that does PID if you needed the, differential part of it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the really um, fun part so is you, you can get an know. approximation of the differential part by just putting a wire in. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I mean, the, oh, this, here's something kind of fun. There are no adders on the chip. So you just need a wire, a signal negator, and then you uh, connect those two things together because they'll, they'll give you a you, basically like addition done with Kirchhoff's law. So it's, uh, nice. yeah, yeah. That's so you good. can, uh, yeah, you just need to make sure that, uh, like, yeah, you take the difference of two signals that are in slightly different points, places in time, but uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, oh man, debugging these things is super fun too. We can talk about that for a long time. Yeah, maybe you should talk Deep about your Debugging it doesn't sound fun. <laughs> it's interesting, <laughs> put it that way. Okay. Yeah, all right, Max, you should probably ask your security question in a minute, but I have another question. So there's this thing, I don't know if you've heard of it, called machine learning where a lot of people yep. are, use all this digital stuff to I model think size. I know. Bad, <laughs> yep. it's gonna pass. <laughs> I've heard of it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, in a very high level that probably butchers everything, it seems like a lot of people are thinking, wow, brains are cool. We should make those with computers. And yep, I don't people have done that in biology that says, I'm super digital besides something like DNA. It feels like synapses sending out signals is much more of an analog type thing and yeah I'm any random thoughts about that because yeah it, there's a lot of work on analog neuromorphic computing oh okay yeah um, there's a lot of work on it yeah, on that. Yeah. Say, it seems like being able to um make something more modular is sort of a vital component of that in some way but i don't know if you have any thoughts about that as like what you're doing 
Yeah, I mean, I think with uh, the with the neural with the neuromorphic computing, they have a bunch. They have an analog fabric that implements a lot of regular structures, um, so you don't have this kind of weird heterogeneity that you have with the hardware I'm working with. Uh, and also, I mean, um, neural like neural like a spiking neural network uh, have very well defined variables, right? Like, you know the ranges. Like, I mean, there, there's kind of like this domain. Like, I mean. You don't have to worry about handling signals. I mean, with dynamical systems, I mean, there isn't really like, if I point to a variable, and you can't just give me a range that the variable is going to be in like easily in a, in a way that's going to like generalize across all, all applications. I mean, basically, it's, it's a more restrictive uh, computational model in the sense that uh, like the, 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 the variables in a neural, in a, like in a spike neural network have like, they correspond to physical quantities and you know they're going to be between like zero and one or you know zero and some other i mean i don't i don't know i don't know the ranges off the top of my head but uh you know what I, I mean you know what i mean like uh it's a more it's a more specialized model but i guess uh, to make that like, to talk about the analog bit analog is hard to miniaturize uh and so i think running these like large-scale billion neuron computations is like not i don't know it's I don't think it's the best use of, I mean, it's the use of analog, but I, I don't, yeah. I don't know if you'd win out over like, a, well, you might, I, it, I think it'd be harder to win out over digital in terms of scaling up the system. Awesome. That was a very long winded answer. But no, I hope I answered it. <laughs> so Sarah, in security, sort of an interesting problem is that like the supply chain threat model where, you know, like I'm talking to you, we're on, a, this is a Mac, that you're talking to me from at the moment, and yep. uh, uh, and it's manufactured, you know, presumably in China or or Vietnam or something. Oh, probably Taiwan with TSMC. I oh, think okay. everything pretty much goes. Yeah, and and you know, I I have no personal way of knowing that there aren't like super secret spy people in the Taiwan factory filling my computer with evil evil chips, yep. and the various things. Yeah, actually, I was like a little off topic or related, but like not answering your question. I went to a microelectronics workshop recently. And there were a whole bunch of like DARPA, like, you know, DOE type, yeah. like military people. And they all agree that one of the stupidest decisions the U.S. made was outsourcing fabrication of electronics. Oh, yeah. Because it's just like, it's a huge security nightmare now. Yeah, totally. And uh, so there's it's actually a very big grant um, where they're trying to re revitalize manufacturing in the U.S. specifically for circuit fabrication uh, because it's becoming such a headache. That's interesting. Um, it yeah. seems like with analog computers, you could like pretty much guarantee that the chip is what you paid for by just like reading the voltage across different components over and over and over and making sure that they're roughly what you'd expect them to be. And if you like randomly chose what things to measure the voltage across and you had something that would tell you, you know, if you choose these two components, you should expect a voltage that's like has this behavior, then you, know, you could have like some kind of epsilon type guarantee that's like if you measure at least this many times, you have at least this much confidence that it's the chip that you expect it to be. Is that kind of correct? So analog, so analog hardware is actually attractive for security purposes for a different reason. I actually have a colleague who's working on um, analog circuits that are impossible to reverse engineer. Well, uh, how, why? The, the reason, well, not impossible, but like uh, basically you would break the circuit if you tried to like, because I mean, with a digital compute, like let's say uh, I'm, I, I send to TSMC uh, something that is supposed to uniquely identify my device. Right, so TSMC could produce that thing, and then they could actually give a digital circuit. They can sit there and they can uh, take a picture of it, and they can like uh, you know measure. I mean, I'm not an expert on fabrication, but I think they can internally probe uh, some of the signals uh, with with an analog version of this, with an analog version of an identifier of like a hardware identifier. You would break the circuit um, if you tried to do this, um, and also you cannot because the currents are so small, you can't really get as much information by uh, taking a snapshot of it. So they're working on a uh, like you know, uh, analog uh, basically analog like an analog identifier uh, that is resilient to the sort of sort of tampering. Yeah. Oh, I guess, I don't know if that really answered your question, but if you're if you're asking like can analog be used I mean, for security, cool. <laughs> the answer is yes, and you can also use it for attacks. Um, there's a lot of really interesting analog attacks as well. Like, have you read any of Kevin Fu's work? No, I've only read the formal methods literature. I haven't read any of okay. your like so his whole, people stuff. So his whole thing is uh, sensors don't sense the thing that you're sensing, right? They sense something that is correlated with the thing that you're sensing more strongly than the other things that they're picking up. And so his whole, his whole body of work has been, can we trick 
the analog circuits and things to think something is happening when it isn't, right? So he has a lot of really, really cool demos. Like he had one where he would emit a, a sound from your laptop, from the laptop, and then it would disengage the, pla the hard drive head, right? Because the hard drive thing thought it was falling because it was uh, res because the PCB board was resonating uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, like a, at a at a particular frequency where the, the re where that frequency would actually trigger the sensor, the accelerometer, to think that um, that the computer's been dropped, right? That's wild. Super cool stuff. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's super wild. Um, yeah, no, I mean, if you ever want to like, he also is great at giving talks. So if you ever get a chance to go to one of his talks, because he brings in little demos and stuff. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's pretty nifty. Stuff emailing all his grad students and get one of them to come give a talk to uh, the group. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a line of work with a lot of stuff. For oh, do you know what's really funny for the resonant issue? Do you know what the fix was? The, the security fix? Uh, what was it? They drilled holes in the PCB board. So it couldn't resonate any. <laughs> it wouldn't resonate. Oh, in the no, any. <laughs> Literally, it's like a, with a drill, right? <laughs> that's what analog devices said. Yeah. So I don't know. There's some really cool security stuff uh, in, this, in this area. Sorry, I have another question. Uh, so if the device operates based on drawing currents and routing these currents through different parts of the chip, mm -hmm. um, I would imagine you could perform something akin to a side channel attack by looking at how much power the chip draws from the power supply at any given time. Have you thought about how the compiler could optimize how the circuit is laid out in, chip, in the chip so that you have less sensitivity to the total current drawn into the device when performing a computation? Well, this works. This device works with really small currents. In fact, uh, for the energy measurements, I couldn't actually directly measure the the power being consumed by the chip because they were it was too small of a current for me to pick up with the measurement devices I had. Like they have specialized devices for taking these measurements. How small Probably, are these currents? Uh, microamps. So ten to the minus okay. six. Yeah, so they're okay. very very small. Mm -hmm. um, so the fluctuations I think would be quite quite difficult to uh, to detect. Now something that could be really interesting is um, if the, uh, if the, if the analog circuit is sensitive to external conditions, you might be able to extract information about like a digital coprocessor um, by, by programming in like an oscillator, for example, and seeing how the oscillator characteristics change. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. So we should, uh, probably wrap up in a couple minutes, but I've got one more question for you, which mm -hmm. is earlier on, you mentioned that working in this direction was a bit of a risk. And yep. it seems like it was really interesting and worked out and now you're off to other exciting things. I'm curious if you can talk a bit about what it was like starting on a project like this and what you're thinking about uh, going forward. Yeah, so I think something that's very difficult about this sort of project is it doesn't matter if I did my job correctly, if the hardware doesn't work. So there was this really nerve wracking part of my thesis where I got the hardware, nothing worked. Because I, I changed the abstraction level. I wrote, I rewrote their firmware. I changed everything, you know. I, I, I changed the whole software stack because my compiler couldn't target what they gave me. Uh, and that part was pretty scary, right? Because I didn't know that the hardware would work in the end. Kind of uh, operating based on, it was like a faith-based thesis. I was kind of hoping that, you know, the, the students working on this did their, did their, you know, their jobs and that the hardware worked. Because if, if it didn't work, then I wouldn't have a thesis, right? Well, I have a much less impressive thesis, I guess. Um, going forward, I'm actually, so I'm joint in the double E department and I'm working on other sorts of like non-traditional hardware. So currently I'm looking at a, a multi-bit resistive RAM. Have you guys heard of that? No? So the idea is you can cram five bits into a single memory cell uh, with this new memory technology. However, the, the problem is uh, when you, when, I mean, and, and the way you do this is it's, it's an analog substrate, right? So it, uh, you, you can store, uh, you can store your value, you store your values of conductance, and then it drifts over time. So the reason why they, they discretize it is because they want to make it robust against uh, the effects of drift. Uh, and so I'm now, I'm, I mean, I just started this like uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, but I'm currently coming up with symbolic models that characterize uh, how drift evolves. And the idea is like, maybe we can automatically come up with a domain specific encoding. You have a program, you have data you want to store in this medium. You want to store it as densely as possible. And you're okay with error in some parts of your data versus others. Um, how do you automatically derive this encode, like the, the correct encoding for this uh, storage medium? So I guess I'm just looking at other weird hardware and like, you know, uh, the problems associated with using it or having it behave in a way that's reliable or usable. So 
That sounds super cool. Sarah, thank you so much for talking to us. This was a badass talk. We really enjoyed having you. And oh, good. I, I have actually gotten multiple messages from people saying that they want to watch the video afterward who couldn't make it, including our buddy Joe, who I'm excited to hear what he thinks, who does bioengineering. So thank mm -hmm. you again for joining us. And um, if people want to uh, uh, you know, harangue you with more emails with all their questions about non-traditional hardware, is that okay? Can they reach out to you? Oh, but yeah, it's 100% fine. I love talking about this stuff. So Perfect. Well, thank you. Happy again. to talk, talk more. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing this. <laughs> no problem. We enjoyed it. All right. Have a nice evening. Your slides were amazing. Yeah, they, they were, were really so good. good. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Can, do, did you? Okay. Are any of you guys on the job market soon? I can give you guys advice. Uh, please give advice. Yeah, give I don't it know anyway. the answer. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I made everything on Google Slides, uh, which ended up being amazing. Because then, like, if you want, like, you can basically have, like, if you want to share your slides with somebody, they can give you feedback in terms in in the form of comments and ah. um so all of the figures are made everything is made with google drive um or google google the google slides. job advice is not anything related to double e any of the cool researchers just use google slides oh no, no there's other job advice too <laughs> yeah. um, but uh actually, that was that actually it was google slides then we'll all get professorships at stanford Perfect. before we yeah that, 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 that's that's it was a definitely the make or break thing but i mean for the pandemic it did really help because it turned out that i had to you know present remotely a lot yeah. Uh, and uh, it just was very seamless. I don't know. Like the, the tooltip always worked. And the only thing is that you can't see presenter notes. So I have to, I have to, mem I have to memorize everything. Um, I guess for if you guys are on the job market, I think to keep in mind, uh, people who read your application are not going to be from your field. So it's, accessibility is really important. If you want, all of my job materials are on my website. Cool. So you can download my research statement and whatnot. And I'm happy to share my thesis slides or my job talk slides and stuff if you guys are interested. That's anyway, that was a total left fielder, but. No, super useful. Thanks again, Sarah. Yeah, no problem. Okay, adios. Bye. Bye-bye.